Hey guys, welcome back to part 9 of the Kotlin tutorial. So now we already know how to create variables of different data types and how to do stuff with them like printing them out to the console or doing mathematical calculations. And the way we did it so far by declaring each variable one by one works well if we only have a few of them. But what if we have a large amount of values that we want to store in variables? So let's say for example we have 20 different names that we want to store in string variables and then use in our code. Of course we could create a separate variable for each of them, like name1, name2, all the way to name20. But this would be quite a lot of code just for declaring variables. And what if we want to store an even larger number, like a thousand names or 20,000? For this reason Kotlin provides ways to store multiple values in a single variable name and then access them by an index. And the most basic one of them is the so-called array, which we will learn about in this video. So let's delete all the code of our main function and make it empty again. And then we create a val names. And in here we want to store multiple names at once in the form of an array. And for this we don't have a literal, instead we have to make a function call. So we call array of, and in here pass our different values separated by commas. So let's say we want to store Jim, John, and Jenny. We will just use three values for now. And as you can see, the IDE automatically added this type hint. We could also write this out explicitly, but as we already know, we don't have to do this because Kotlin can infer the type. And the same way it can infer normal strings or numbers, it can also infer that this is an array. And even if we don't declare the type explicitly, IntelliJ IDEA sometimes adds this tag, which isn't actually real text. It's just there to avoid any confusion. If you want, you can disable these hints or change in which situations they are shown. For this, you can just right click on it and either click on disable hints or hint settings. But I will keep it because it's quite useful. And the part here between the angle brackets is the type of the values we put into this array. So in other words, this names variable is an array of strings. And if we now want to access one of these elements, we can just write names because then the compiler would know which element we want to access. Instead, we have to do it the following way. So let's say we want to print out the first element. Then we make our placeholder dollar sign, as we already know, curly braces, and then we write names, square brackets like this, and the index of the element. And important, the index starts at zero. So if we want to access the first element, Jim, we have to write a zero in here. So let's print this. And indeed, first element Jim. And in the same way, John is element at the index 1 and Jenny is index 2. And we can also replace elements in this array. So we could write names, let's take the first element again, equals, and then we pass another string, Jeremy. So now Jim will be replaced for Jeremy, so our array after that will be Jeremy, John, Jenny. And Jim will be gone. So let's print it out again. And indeed we can see first element Jeremy. But now you might be wondering, didn't we say that val means that we can't change a variable later? So why can we now change this array, even though we declared our names variable as a val and not as a var? This is because val only means that we can't reassign this variable. In other words, we can't put a different array in here. So we can't say names equals and call array off again for a different one, like this. This will show us a warning. Val cannot be reassigned. For this we would have to use a var, and then it works. But with a val, we can still make changes to whatever object is already in there. So we can make changes to the array itself, because it's still the same array. The same way your car is still the same car after you replace the tires. Now one thing you have to watch out for is not trying to access an index that doesn't exist. So if we would try to print the name at the index 5 and run this, we get an error, which says index 5 out of bounds for length 3, because our array doesn't have an index 5. And this is a so-called array index out of bounds exception. And such a so-called runtime exception is different from the compiler errors that we already know. Because these exceptions happen while the app is running, whereas the compiler error is caught before we can even run our code, at compile time. And runtime exceptions are more problematic, because those are the kind of errors that can crash our app while someone is already using it. 
And the reason this doesn't throw a compile time error is because the size of an array isn't always known at compile time. It can also be said while the app is running. For this reason the compiler doesn't check this. Instead we have to make sure that we don't try to access an index that doesn't exist. And also the size of an array is fixed after we initialized it. So this array here will always have the size 3. We can't add any new elements to it. We can only replace elements. Now what we could do is creating a copy of it and give it a bigger size. But then it's a different array. Later we will learn about more flexible collection types which can grow and shrink. But for now the array will suffice. And let's revert this back to the index 0 so we don't get our crash anymore. And if you want to know the size of an array to make sure that you don't access an index that doesn't exist, then we can find this out over a variable that is inside the array. So let's say we want to print the number of elements in our array. Dollars and curly braces. Then we can write names dot size. The same way we can call a function on an object, like we did it when we converted our numbers earlier. Some objects, like our array here, also have variables in them which we can access like this with a dot. And this size variable will contain the int value of whatever size our array has. So when we run this, it shows number of elements 3. Because we have 3 names in our names array. And since the index starts at 0, the value of the size variable is always one greater. So we have index 0, 1, 2 in an array of size 3. It's important to keep that in mind to avoid crashes later. And when we typed in size, you might have noticed that there is a get and z function in there. Those are the functions that retrieve and replace a value in the array, but Remember in our primitives kt file, we had these plus and minus and multiply functions, but we said that we don't have to call them, instead we can use the arithmetic operator symbols for plus, minus and so on. And the same way these get and z functions here can be replaced by the index operator that we already used here. So when we write names at the index of 0 equals Jeremy to replace this element, it internally calls z on this names variable. And when we only want to retrieve the value like we do here to print it out, it internally cards get. So you don't have to bother with the set and get functions. You only have to use this square brackets operator. And of course, instead of just strings, we can also put other data types into an array. So this would be automatically inferred as an array of int. And not only that, we can even mix types within the same array. So we could put a number and a string in here, which generates this huge array type here. You don't have to understand what exactly this means. You can just see this as the type that int and string have in common. In other words, when we now take our numbers array and replace a value, we can put strings and ints in here. But we cannot put other data types in here, like a char for example, because it doesn't fit to this type, unless of course, we put a char in here in the first place. Now this type changes once again, and now we have the common data type of char, int, and string inferred. And we can put char, ints, and strings into our numbers array. And of course you could put even more types in here. You could even create an array that takes every type. And we could even create an array that contains more arrays. So we could write array of and fill it with more array of cards. So let's say array of 1, 2, 3, outside of the inner array of call, comma, array of again, 4, 5, 6, and I'm gonna put this into separate lines for a better formatting. And the third one, 7, 8, 9. And now you can see the type of this array is an array of arrays of int. And now we have a so-called two-dimensional array. And you could imagine this like a table, where each element of the array is its own array with elements. And we could nest this even further to create more dimensional arrays. And now if we wanted to access a value in here, like for example we want to get this 5 in the middle of it, we would write numbers, square brackets, this array here is the index 1, outside of it another pair of square brackets, and again the index 1, because it's the second element in this middle array. And when we print this, 
indeed we can see our five. And if you have more dimensions, then you have to add more square brackets. But of course, filling these larger arrays with values and treating them out manually like here is not very efficient either. And later we will learn how we can do this in a more automated way, but not for now. And I will also delete this because it's quite complicated and I don't want to get you confused. If you use simple arrays like this, it's enough for now. And another interesting thing is that strings also support this index operator. We can use it to access the single characters in it. So we could take our Jeremy, which is at index zero, make another pair of square brackets. And let's say we want to get the letter R. Then this is at the index 0, 1, 2. So we write names 0, 2 and start this. And indeed we can see the letter R. And this whole expression here has the type char because a string is basically an array of chars. But strings only support this get operation. You can't change a character in a string. But what a string does have is the length variable, which gives us the number of chars in the string. So this would print out 6 because this string has 6 chars. Let's try it out. And indeed we see the number 6. I will also give you a homework for this video. Let's say we want to print out the last element in our names array. So we write last element, placeholder, we have three elements, so the last one is names, index 2. When we print this, we should see a Jenny. Last element Jenny, this works. But if we now add another element to our array, we can do this up here because this is the place where we initialize it. We can only not do it after it was initially created, but up here we can add another element. Our array now has a size of 4. But of course, now this down here isn't correct anymore. The last element isn't name at the index 2 anymore. It's a name at the index 3. And your homework is to find out what you have to put into this placeholder to always print out the last element, no matter how many elements are in our array. If you want, you can also post your solution in the comments. And at the end, I want to clarify one more thing for our Java developers. This array class here always uses object types. So if we create an array of 1, 2, 3, this would be an integer array on the JVM, not an array of primitive ints. If you want to have arrays of primitive types, for example for efficiency reasons or for interoperability with Java, you have to call dedicated functions for that. So in the case of int, this would be int array of. So this would be compiled to a primitive int array. And the same way we have byte array of char array of and for all other primitive types and instead of calling these functions you can also initialize them over their constructor where you have to pass a size like this and this would create an int array with a size of 9 where each element is automatically initialized with the default value 0 just like normal java int arrays for arrays of object types there are also constructors but the initialization process requires a bit more kotlin knowledge which is beyond the scope of this video for all our beginners, I would say the normal array is enough. So just use this array of call, ignore the other ones. They are mainly necessary for Java interoperability or in situations which are really performance critical. Nothing you have to bother with right now. Don't forget your homework and don't forget to like this video. And then we see us in the next part. Take care.